Thanks, everybody. Um, so I feel a lot of pressure to live up to this definition of hack. And I think it's going to be really interesting because you're going to find out that it's not super clever other than being extremely simple and straightforward. People are in the jail because they don't have money. We use money to buy their freedom and get them out of the jail. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that goes into that and a lot of reasons why that's the case that we'll talk about and a lot of um, stuff you're probably familiar with from looking at city data about who's impacted by different policies we have about who's in the jail. Um, it's not equal, obviously. And I also want to start with a caveat that Micah and I are two of about 12 people who are co-founders of the Bond Fund. So we're here tonight, but we're not um, the co-founders. We're part of a group. So anything you want to say? I also want to say I go by she, her, hers. Well, you can use he and him for me. So the Chicago Community Bond Fund started informally as a group of people that was raising money to bond out people who were arrested at a community vigil for Deshaun Pittman. Deshaun Pittman is a 17-year-old young black man who lived on the city's south side. He was killed by Chicago police in August of 2014. And CPD arrested eight people at a vigil for him, including and five people they charged with serious felonies, including his mother. So a group of people, including the mothers of some of those arrested, some activists who generally work against criminalization, mass incarceration, um, and attorneys with the National Lawyers Guild were crowdsourcing the funds to get them out. It was almost $30,000 in total for all five people. We were able to get Deshaun's mother out the day before his funeral so that she was able to attend his funeral. But it took us four months to get the last person out. Um, so we didn't get the fifth person out until December of 2014, at which point his mother, who'd been working with us to hold house parties and fish fries and do these online fundraisers, said, this is great, he's out. This is terrible that it took four months. No one should have to be in that situation again. So what are we going to do next time? We should start a revolving fund so that the funds are there and they're ready and we don't have to let my kid or someone else's kid sit in Cook County Jail for four months because I don't have $8,000. This is our mission. It's on our website. You can read it. Essentially, what we do is we post bond for people, and we also advocate for the end of money bail and a dramatic reduction in pretrial detention. Our website is chicagobond.org. I don't think that was on the first slide. No, oh, it was not. So. Obviously, there are more people in Cook County Jail who need help than we can help. Um, we use a set of 11 interactive factors to evaluate requests for help. This is some of them, not all of them. They're all on our website if you want to look for them. Essentially, we try to recognize that incarceration is violence. It's violence against everyone who is being kept in a cage, but it does impact people differently. So there are people who face unique threats or risks or consequences of being in the jail. And when we get to the part about telling some stories of people that we've bonded out, you'll hear more about some of the specific ways that being incarcerated pre-trial impacted them and why we posted bond for them. The way these factors work out is interesting and creates a lot of important intersections. So the second person that we ever posted bond for as an organization this was in December of 2015, was Naomi Freeman. And Naomi Freeman was a 23-year-old mother of two who was also six months pregnant by the time that we posted bond for her. Um, in the middle of an attack by an abusive partner, she defended herself, and she was charged with first-degree murder. We partnered with 16 other national and local organizations that work on issues of domestic violence and issues of criminalization of self-defense, which disproportionately impacts black women to post her $35,000 bond. And she was bonded out December 23rd, two days before Christmas. And she gave birth in early March to a healthy baby. And she is still out and fighting her case and taking care of her three, three young kids. And this is, I start with this because she was charged with first degree murder and she had a high bond. And she's not someone you think of when you think these people starting a bond fund, they're going to bond out the sympathetic cases or the nice cases or the misdemeanors or something like that. But what we want to do, in part, is bring these conversations together. So the conversation about the criminalization of self-defense and its impact on black women 
and the fact that Naomi was locked up for surviving an attack against her and linking with these other activist groups who are working in a variety of different issues and also getting Naomi out. So because a lot of this is legal technicalities, I just wanted to give a brief overview of how someone gets to the point where they have a money bond and they get to the jail. Someone's arrested. They're sent to bond court if they have a felony. Everyone goes to bond court. Misdemeanors, most people get released from the police station. Most people in bond court are then given a D bond, which is a money bond. It means that they have to pay 10% of the amount that the judge sets. So if the judge says you have a $10,000 D bond, they have to post $1,000 to get out. At that point, the sorting mechanism goes from uh, charges, background, other mitigating factors that a defense attorney or public defender can raise in court to money and access to money. Either someone is able to pay or someone is not able to pay. And that's how we sort who's in Cook County Jail for the most part. And this statistic, this 9 and 10 statistic, that's a national statistic. And when someone can't pay bond here, they go to Cook County Jail, which is the largest single site jail in the country. So there are technically more people in jail in, Cook, in uh, Los Angeles and New York, but they have different jails were the largest single one. Right now, there are about 7,500 people in Cook County Jail, and 95% of them are pre-trial, which means they're supposed to be presumed innocent. And the vast majority of those people, about two-thirds of the pre-trial detainees, have a money bond that they just can't pay. And as of two weeks ago, on the 15th, there were 344 people who were detained on bonds of $10,000 or less, which means they only needed someone to post $1,000 on their behalf, and they would get out. I mentioned this at the beginning because it's a civic hack night, and issues of equality and equity in our city are so pronounced. But the jail is overwhelmingly African American, especially compared to the population of Cook County, because it's the Cook County Jail and not just the Chicago Jail. So it is. 88% black and brown people inside Cook County Jail, even though the percentage, especially for black residents of Cook County, is much lower. We're the Chicago Community Bond Fund, and we talk a lot about ending money bail because it's a really easy way to introduce the subject. I think everyone sort of understands when we get to that point in that flow chart I had where it splits between people who can pay and people who can't pay, why that's fundamentally unfair and why we're using money as a sorter for who's in a cage and who's free. But when we talk about the harms of money bail, we're really talking about the harms of pretrial detention. So we're talking about the consequence of someone not paying and then being kept in jail. And it's really um, a mechanism at the beginning of someone's involvement in the criminal legal system that sends them further, and it has repercussions throughout the entire case and it just sends people in deeper. So compared to similarly situated people who are not detained, people who are in jail awaiting trial have a greater chance of pleading guilty and of being found guilty by a jury, and they're also going to receive longer sentences, and they're more likely to receive sentences that, have them, that result in them being incarcerated as opposed to community sentences like probation or other sorts of sentences. It also causes lost jobs and housing, lost custody of children. It can cause disruption of services or access to basic supports like Medicaid and Social Security. Essentially what we're doing is we're taking away the few things that people have that are supporting them and enabling them to possibly succeed or connections to the legal economy, and we're making sure that they don't have those anymore by the time their case is over, and they're going to be in an even worse position after this period of incarceration. And I think I get to this in a later slide, but that's one of the reasons why detaining people pre-trial actually increases recidivism. So when you detain people before they're convicted, you're actually making it more likely that they're going to be arrested for something in the future. Oh, here that is. I think we covered this. Longer sentences, more likelihood of being sentenced, being convicted, and being sentenced, and increasing recidivism. The way this fits into the national picture, the larger picture of criminal justice reform, is that people are more likely to plead 
guilty because they are taking plea deals to get out of a cage that they're in. And if you haven't read The Bail Trap by the New York Times, I highly recommend this article. It's a really great overview of the problem with pretrial detention and money bail in particular. It's a pretty well-known fact among defense counsel that there are judges in Cook County that prefer more people, more defendants in front of them are in custody because it means their cases move faster and they're under pressure to keep their docket numbers low. So if someone's going to end their case faster because they're in custody, then that works better for the system. Because we all know that the number of cases, the number of um, prosecutions has gone up tremendously over the last 30 years. This is just a great graphic that we don't have time to spend time on, but hopefully it'll go up later. You can find it from Vera Institute of Justice about the way that jails are used nationally. And I also really recommend Prison Policy Initiative's website, which has state profiles on every state. So it has information about trends in Illinois. You can see the rise of mass incarceration and tough on crime social rhetoric. And its impact, you can see how disproportionately we incarcerate black people in Illinois over all other groups. This is the incarceration rate, so it's per 100,000 people. All these graphs are on Prison Policy Initiative's website. And this shows how, many, how jails relate to state prisons. So there are 21,000 people in local jails. This is from 2010. And at that time, Cook County Jail was about half of that number. It was closer to 10,000 people. So we have decreased the population of Cook County Jail some. And I should say, we also have one of the largest state prison populations in the country, which is people who are sentenced for longer than a year. And that said, jails and prisons are still overall a relatively small percentage of people who are under state control or surveillance. So nationally and in Illinois, people who are actually in custody in jail or prison make up about a third of people who are under correctional control, and two-thirds of people are in other, some other form of a community corrections or community control, like probation or parole. All right, so Tyler is one of the first few people that we posted bond for, and we actually posted bond for Tyler to get off of electronic monitoring. Um, and not to get out of Cook County Jail. And the reason was is because the electronic monitoring that he was on was just supposed to be seen as a kinder alternative to the jail, something more flexible. It was something he was probably given by the judge precisely because he was working two jobs. But being on electronic monitoring got him fired from those jobs. It's very irregular. The system for getting permission to leave your home, it's essentially home incarceration. Then you are given permission to leave, but it can vary day to day. It's very erratic. It makes it hard to hold down a job for most people. He was fired specifically because sheriff's deputies came to his jobs, which his employers didn't like, even though they liked him. And after we posted $2,500 to get him off of electronic monitoring, he was working again the next week at the job that he previously had. And his case is actually about to resolve and 2,400 of those dollars will come back into the revolving bond fund. And of course, Tyler and his mom still have a place to live. And Leon's story is a really good one that I like to tell because it shows the difference in outcomes between when someone has money and when they don't, or when someone comes to us and we're able to post bond for them versus everyone else who's in a similar situation. Leon was in Growing Homes Urban Farm Job Training Program in Englewood, a great program. They only have three six-week sessions per year. Uh, relatively close to the beginning of the session, Leon was arrested for stealing toiletries, and he was given a $25,000 D-bond, also requiring $2,500 to get out. We posted bond for him because his Growing Home case managers knew about us and contacted us and asked us to. And because we posted bond, he was able to complete Growing Homes training program. His case was dismissed two weeks later. He would have been in custody for those two weeks, though, and those two weeks in custody would have prevented him from finishing the program. And he's currently working at Italy, Chicago. He has a full-time job. He's a success story from Growing Homes standpoint, from our standpoint, and he would be in a completely different situation if he hadn't had our help posting that bond. 
So, so far we have posted $175,000. We are bonding out around 7.30 p.m. our 40th person. And the lowest bond we've posted is $200. We've posted two bonds that were $35,000, Naomi's bond and uh, activist Jamal Green's bond. We have had six bonds returned so far. We haven't lost any money other than the $100 clerk's fees. And we've had three babies born to uh, <laughs> bond fund uh, clients, so including Morgan's daughter, which was born, she was born about two weeks after that photo was taken. That photo was taken um, like across the street from the jail, right when she got out. And that's her mother and her godmother. So the other thing we want to do in telling these personal stories, we want to tell the personal narratives and we want to shift the public perception of people who are charged with crimes because right now there's a lot of comfort with locking people up. We don't know who's locked up. We don't know what being locked up is doing to them, is doing to their families. We also want to use statistics and we want to say, look, Leon would have been in the jail. He didn't, he was, there's no public safety risk to having our folks out. No one is getting rearrested. No one is not making their court dates. They just didn't have money. That's not an acceptable way to make decisions about incarceration. The two most well-known bond funds are in New York, the Bronx Freedom Fund and the Brooklyn Community Bail Fund. And what they found is essentially that their clients who they post bond for come to court at a higher rate than people who put their own money up for bail. So it's not about the money, and there is no real evidence-based reason why we use money. And they're also finding that when their clients are out and they're free and they can fight their cases, they're getting different and better results. All right. What do we do if we aren't doing money bail? Well, the one thing we can do that's really easy is we can mandate non-monetary release for as many people as feasible. So a lot of judges, it's sort of a CYA move to use money bail because you set bail and then if they pay, they, you know, it's, it's not really on you. Um, but when someone comes into contact with the court system for retail theft, there's not really a good reason why we should immediately put them in a cage. In fact, they should just get out. And most people are when they're charged with retail theft, but not everyone. We need to expand the range of charges where people are just getting out immediately um, and judges don't feel that they are going to be on the hook if something happens, that there is going to be some sort of Willie Horton moment and they're going to be vilified and they're going to be hung out to dry. We also need to use verified race neutral risk assessment tools. So what we know, what we all know is that as humans, we have implicit biases and those impact our discretionary decision making. And risk assessment tools, when they've been used in other jurisdictions, have shown that they can reduce the racial disparity in pretrial release. Essentially, they let more people of color out than judges who are just using their discretion. They're still based on fundamentally flawed information because they're essentially looking at arrest records, which are not race neutral. And we can also use less restrictive, more supportive means to make sure that people are making their court dates. We need to shift the risk that we're willing to accept so we're not putting people in a cage for weeks, months, and potentially years because we're worried about them missing a court date. That's not a good enough reason to do that, to incarcerate someone. Um, and we're not talking about fleeing the country and evading justice. We're just talking about missing an appointment for most people. We can do a lot of good by providing text message reminders, phone call reminders, bus cards, offering childcare. Something they're doing in New York is expanding the hours so that people who can't get off work or don't have childcare are able to come in the evening to their court dates. And we can continue to support things that just divert people away from the criminal justice system entirely and keep people out of coming into the system. OK, I'm going to talk really quick about the tech part of the Chicago Community Bond Fund, which is meager and strange. Um, <laughs> but I think it shares a lot of things that a lot of small community organizations really have problems with. Um, you need basically three things to start an organization. You need a website, you need a way to take people's money, and you need a way to talk to them. And all three of these things are still either hard or pretty expensive. Um, the bond fund is like uniquely price sensitive because if we spend $1,000 a year on tech, that is a person who's going to be in a cage who wouldn't otherwise be. Um, so we really, really try hard to keep our overhead low. Um, email. 
15 years ago was like really easy, and now it's really hard because of spammers. Um, so you know, Google used to let you host your domain names there, and it was great. Now you can't. Um, we use Nearly Free Speech, which is one of the oldest internet service providers. Uh, they're great. They're cheap. It works to forward email to people's personal Gmail addresses, because Gmail is the only thing that anybody wants to use for email. I have tried to get people to use anything else, and uh, everybody just wants to use their, their uh, email list. Um, we also use SES to send email through Gmail, which is free, and MailChimp, which is really expensive. Um, all of these things work. Uh, they are all extremely annoying to set up and like probably beyond the reach of most people who are stuck paying $50 per year per person per email address to Amazon or Microsoft or um, whoever else. Um, it would be like really nice if there were better solutions to this, uh, and there aren't. Uh, I'm going to go really fast because we're running short on time. But I think, yes. Uh, all right. Oh. Um, so lots of people take money, uh, Braintree included. Um, almost every sort of nonprofit-oriented site is either uh, really annoying for users to use um, or really expensive, um, an extra 5% or more on top of interchange fees. We use PayPal for uh, uh, the parent company of Braintree for uh, our reoccurring payments and an unnamed uh, other payment processor for uh, uh, our website, where we have a very large donate button with a number in it that you can change. And it works uh, really, really well. We have, um, I don't have the numbers with me, but we have like quite good conversion rates. We have like a really low overhead. I've seen organizations have really bad luck trying to sort of like send people to your page where you have to fill out a lot of information. We have like the minimal amount of information. And it works great. Um, and it is basically free. Uh, it's a some client-side JavaScript and a AWS Lambda function that, uh, oh wait, that's most of it. That's about 20 lines long. Um, uh, it unfortunately sends pretty ugly emails. It is, this is a little better. I don't know how many people have used Lambda much. It used to be like much harder to set up, and now it's a lot easier. There's like almost no one in the world who manages to set up CloudFront and Lambda and all everything else in such a way that it works well and easily. Um, I think there's like several people in the world who have. I am not yet one of them. Um, and our way, and it's you know you don't get a lot of fancy stuff you could do if you are hosting your own website. Um, I think I put these in the wrong order because I'll talk about that later. Um, this should be like a script, right? Like You should be able to say, like, I want a donation widget, and have your little script scatter to the wind and take your API keys and make you a donation widget that works and that's free, and that really, really importantly doesn't get shut down by third parties trying to cover their butts. Um, a lot of crowdfunding places are very, very quick to shut down fundraisers that have the merest whiff of anything having to do with the criminal justice system. It's incredibly common for bail fund fundraisers to get shut down uh, almost immediately, whether or not they are against the terms of service of the provider. So like, we really wanted to minimize the number of uh, places in between our money and uh, our ability to get it. Um, so uh, yeah, so I think. There is like a lot of room in the world for a solution to take people's money that lets uh, it host itself. There's like great tools in the world that work way better than almost every sort of like heavyweight donation site, um, and it's still really annoying to set up. And that's something that I'm working on. Um, our website. Uh, it's also uh, really frustrating and expensive to set up a cheap website that uses your own domain that supports HTTPS that is uh, easy for people to use to update. We have three out of four of those. Uh, it's Jackal, which is a static site generator hosted on Amazon S3. Um, it costs about a dollar and a half a month. 
uh, to host, uh, except when we went from 500 hits a week to about 30,000, then it cost, I think, what did I say there, like $6. Um, it, it's really great. Like I've seen plenty of organizations knocked off the web when they get a little bit of national media coverage like we did after the Trump rally. Um, and I've also seen a lot of, and I think everybody here has probably seen, a lot of WordPress blogs that uh, are like now serving as spam conduits or hosting malware. Um, and the second that happens, you get knocked out of Google, and it's a huge mess. Um, and so again, we were stuck talking about paying perhaps $1,000 a year uh, or doing it itself. It is unfortunately very frustrating to use. I have a plan, someday plan, for a uh, sort of like static site tool that's backed by S3 that is editable by people who. People like me. Right, which is like, <laughs> the, uh, you know, Charlotte knows HTML and she's like competent at uh, making web pages but is not a programmer who is comfortable navigating the bizarre idiosyncrasies of Amazon Web Services. Um, so anyway, work in progress. Um, these are all like really basic things that almost every organization which is trying to get a presence on the web needs, and almost all of them end up looking less than professional uh, in one way or another. Either they're running on like uh, a sort of free web hosting program that puts ads on, or they uh, are like email my personal email address, or like a number of things that really don't broadcast like serious business nonprofit, um, which we think, especially for us, is really important. We're not, uh, you know, we're an organization which I think is like struggling to be legitimate and has a lot of interactions with like very formal parts of the legal system and the nonprofit community. Um, and I think it's like really important for us to be, uh, sort of give the impression of a like serious, well-funded organization um, in spite of our actual slight scrappiness. Um, anyway, so that's our tech stack. There's a lot of work on it. Uh, it's small and weird. Um, and I think it is possible for this to be an easy thing like, we live in an era of great access to computing services, um, and we are still sort of at the cusp of being able to enable everybody to use them in a reasonable way. That's it. OK. <laughs> oh. oh, right, questions. Sorry. Right, time for questions. Um, do you guys see, like, as far as like, long term? What, what seems more plausible to you, like uh, policy or legislative change, or uh, increasing the reach of an organization like this and, and making that a part of a uh, uh, societal culture for that time? We're we're definitely like really focused on the first one. Um, we, yeah, we don't want to exist. Right. Wait, we shouldn't right. have to exist. We don't want to exist. At some point, we're not going to be a novelty, or there won't be. Most of the money that we've raised has come through raising bond money from protests when there were national, there was national media focused on Chicago. So the night that the Laquan McDonald video was released, uh, we did the bond fundraising for that, and there ultimately wasn't any bond needed for Malcolm London or the other people arrested that night. And we also did the bond fundraising for the Trump rally and raised over $50,000, only $10,000 of which was needed to bond out protesters arrested that night. So what we've done is take that money and then use it to bond out non-protesters and other protesters, but people arrested um, not in moments of national attention when everyone wants to whip out their wallet and support people who kept Trump out of Chicago. And um, what we write might really need the money, like we, there's, it's basically impossible to tell how much bond is going to get once people have felony charges. It could be anywhere between, you know, ten or a hundred thousand dollars, and so we have to collect the money when we can. Um. But so we are, we are working with a coalition of organizations that's working on some legislative solutions. Um, there are also a lot of 
policy, like local policy changes that could be made in Cook County in terms of bond court judges, in terms of the risk assessment that is in place now, but is arguably not being honored by judges or factored into judicial decision making that's saying people should be released um, and they're not released anyway. And I don't know what else to want to say. What we don't want to see is like a proliferation of bond funds, especially because not everyone is going to be on the page of, yeah, let's bond out that lady with the first degree murder charge. A lot of bond funds are like, mm, let's bond out people who are 18 to 24 and they have misdemeanors, nonviolent misdemeanors. There's like and a then real... we just see a sorting of who should be in the jail and who shouldn't, right. even though there's no public policy or safety reasons to keep people incarcerated. One of the things we try really hard to avoid, and this is a long answer to your question, of course, but is to be a like sort of half-assed bond court that goes after normal bond court, where they plea their case to the normal bond court, and then if that doesn't work, they try us. Um, we are definitely focused on you know, the policy Systems solutions. Systems change, yeah. So right now, it's mo people are mostly coming to us through partners that we have. So Cabrini Green Legal Aid or Lawndale Christian Legal Center, the Public Defender's Office, um, Growing Home is an example of someone who we consider a partner. We did have open general intakes for three or four months in the spring. And our phone number was up on the wall in the jail. In at least a couple divisions, we were getting five to 10 calls a day from people who needed help, from the family members of people who needed help paying bond. And as an all-volunteer organization, that was not sustainable. And also, we spent the vast majority of the money that we have, and we're down to just an emergency fund, so we don't have the ability to take in general intakes like that right now. Yes. What advice would you have for people who want to start a bond fund in another city? So, uh, we get a lot of questions like that. There's uh, some documents that the Bronx people have put out. Um, there are some New York specific, right. because the New York funds had to get a special statutory exception to allow them to operate, because unlike Illinois, most states in the country have private bail bonds industries. So in those states, a nonprofit bond fund might have to become a licensed bail bondsman or, or otherwise register, get insurance, things like that. We didn't have to do any of that because we don't have that industry here, thank goodness. It's also going to make the legislative changes much easier because we don't have an entity that's profiting off of people's um, need for money to avoid being in a cage, fighting that change. So the New York, there's a, a framework available for people there. Elsewhere, um, we, mo we mostly tell people, if you want to bond people out, that's great. Like, let's get people out now. Let's show people they can succeed. Let's tell their stories. Let's engage in harm reduction, take care of each other. But this is not a solution. We're never going to get everyone out this way. Like, you need to also engage in advocacy efforts that are designed to get everyone out who shouldn't be there. We're also particularly well-placed to have a revolving bond fund, because unlike in other municipalities where you have to pay the whole amount or forfeit 10% to a bondsman, uh, we get all of the bond back except for a small fee, which means that the you know money that we have gets to get used over and over again, um, which makes it a lot more straightforward than in most other places. Yes. Uh, how difficult and slash expensive is it for a small volunteer organization like yourself to get and maintain 501c3 status? Um, that wasn't that bad. We actually did the expedited application. Uh, and we have several lawyers who work with us who gave us free help in applying and drafting bylaws, incorporating as a state nonprofit first, and then filing the IRS paperwork to become a 501c3. And we thought, well, we're not going to raise more than $40,000 this year, so we'll just do the expedited application, which I think has about half the fee of the full 501c3 application. And then right. the Annual fees, it it's not that weeks. much. No. Yeah. Um, that no. was not the, the hurdle. It, the, the, I mean, I think a big part of that, though, is we had a lot of experts who have done this before help us out. Um, if anybody's looking for a project, a like fill in the blank 501c3 application generator would be great. I've talked to 
I mean, I'm saying, like, I've talked to a lot of organizations who just like don't have the connections and don't have the sort of legal expertise, um, and it is either really imposing um, or really expensive. Um, so for us, we lucked out. For a lot of places, I know organizations with like, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars in annual budget who have been around for years who like just, I know one in particular who just got their 501c3 status because it's not easy for non-experts. Yes. This seems like, so I just went to a talk a couple weeks ago about how <coughs> banks and, and the, uh, sort of VC funds are looking at microfinance as a, as a, um, a way to make money. And this seems like a microfinance scheme in a way in that, you know, you can lend your money and you, you have a state guarantee or at least Sort of guarantee of getting there. Um, have you ever thought about trying to sort of scale that way, or do you just would you just rather have the system fix itself? So yeah, we don't want to become a giant entity that um, takes the responsibility off of policymakers for actually making good social policy. And there are actually, I find it kind of terrifying like 95% terrifying and 5% exciting. There are sort of philanthropists from the tech world based in California who have been suggesting to others, like, we should start a national bail fund, and we'll parachute in, and we'll loan the money, and we'll get it back. And um, so Charge that, interest. <laughs> there, other people have, yeah, talked about that as well. Um, so we're really trying to push back on any models that reintroduce profit the way that the private bail bonds industry does or um, that places a premium on mm, secure investments above human freedom. So. Uh, can, can you identify judges in bond court who are metting out bail above the average for particular types of arrest and can they be unelected or unappointed? Yes, um, we can do that, and some people have done that. I don't think that I don't think there's a public campaign around those judges right now. But I think part of what you're saying is that judges are afraid of letting someone out and something bad happening. But we need to make judges feel accountable for keeping people in cages unnecessarily, because that's also a bad outcome that judges can be responsible for. The problem is judicial elections are not very widely watched, um, and it's. It was the early 90s, the last time a judge was voted out. And that was because the FOP, organized, the Fraternal Order of Police, organized against that judge. So you can get a sense of where they were coming from and how well funded um, that campaign was. So I definitely think that judicial accountability is a very real thing that we need. And there are people talking about what that looks like, whether that's more internal to the judiciary or whether it is sort of public campaign led by community groups or whoever it would be around specific judges and their pretrial, their bond court decisions. There is also um, an open source project, which I don't think was developed here. I think it was developed as part of a free geek uh, offshoot, but um, of uh, scraping the Cook County Sheriff's site, collecting information on charges and demographics. Unfortunately, um, it's really easy to get that information. It's really hard to get the presiding judge uh, information. You either have to file FOIA requests or go down to a courthouse and spend hours typing it into a special terminal over and over again. Um, but there are people who are working on that. So I think we have time for one more question each. Um, you kind of um, uh, look pretty quickly through your slides about trends. I was curious, I couldn't quite read the one where you were showing the graph That was um, incarceration in Illinois. So that's all in prison policy initiatives website. I mean, basically what that is is the rise of mass incarceration. Um, it's the rise of the drug war, mandatory minimums, and it's the thing that makes the US a global outlier in how many people we keep in cages, right? Like we've all seen the, the statistics that we have 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prisoners, 2.2 million people incarcerated. Most of those people are in state prisons. 
just the way they are in Illinois. Um, and this is basically 1978 to 2011. And that number has either gone up or been mostly steady across the country with slight declines in certain states in the last five years. Does that answer the question? Yeah. And we'll be around for a few minutes if anybody has pressing questions they'd like to ask us off camera. Awesome. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you.